Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Laura Prada from the Telesur headquarters in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. And we start talking about U.S. Special Counsel Robert Mueller, who has said that charging President Donald Trump with a crime following his investigation was not an option, as a Special Counsel Mueller was tasked with investigating alleged Russian interference in the 2016 presidential elections. Our findings and analysis and the reasons for the decisions we made. We chose those words carefully, and the work speaks for itself. And the report is my testimony. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. After Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's failure to form a coalition government, Israeli lawmakers have voted to dissolve the parliament. This triggered the call for an election, which is scheduled for September 17. Our correspondent in Egypt, Nayara Tardo, has more information for us on the following report. Local media in Israel has reported that this Wednesday the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, was obliged to call new elections. Netanyahu won the elections in April, however, he hasn't been able to create a cabinet nor reach an agreement with other political parties to form a government. The principal obstacle for Netanyahu in these negotiations has been with the far-right Avigdor Lieberman, the defense minister and the leader of Yisra Beitenau, party. During his time as defense minister, he has led numerous political aggressions against the Palestinian people. Local media has reported that Lieberman sought to adopt a law to conscript young Orthodox Jews into the military, which Netanyahu opposed. Lieberman demanded the conspiration as part of any agreement to govern. Israeli president said that if an agreement wasn't reached today, legislative elections could be called again for the end of August or the beginning of September. As you mentioned, during his time as defense minister, Lieberman adopted cruel, aggressive measures against the Palestinian people, as has Netanyahu. Every time he dared during one of the internal cabinet crises he has faced. He has also implemented expansion policies supporting Jewish settlements in Palestinian territories in order to gather votes and gain the support of Israeli colonies. However, local media has, have highlighted protests against Netanyahu last weekend because of corruption allegations. Regional analysts have said that this is the reason why aggression against Palestine has increased incrementally, above all in the West Bank. Around 21 Palestinians were arrested without justification in the West Bank and Jerusalem yesterday. What we know is that today was the deadline given for Netanyahu to create a cabinet and instead elections will be called. Thank you, Nayara. And New Zealand teachers have embarked on a nationwide strike demanding higher pay following failed negotiations with the government. Thousands of teachers took to the streets in the largest education walkout the country that has ever seen. More than 700,000 students were affected as several primary and secondary schools closed for the day. The strike also takes place at government is set to present its national budget. We just need time to teach. We need money to actually to afford to live in Auckland. We need our kids to have the time they deserve. We need so much from so many people. We have to give so much to so many people, and we don't have the time to do it. And a top Mexican executive known as the King of Steel has been arrested in Spain. Alonso Ancira is accused of paying million dollars bribes to Emilio Lozoya, the former director of the Mexican state oil company Pemex. Ancira is the head of Altos Hornos de, Mexi de Mexico, one of the country's largest steel companies. A judge also issued an arrest warrant for his alleged co conspirator Emilio Lozoya, who was also a top advisor to the former president Enrique Peña Nieto. And now we talk about Colombia because the Supreme Court has ordered that the former FARC leader, Jesus Santrich, be set free. 
According to the court, Santrich has immunity thanks to his position as a representative in the country's lower house of Congress. Earlier this month, Santrich was released from prison only to be arrested just minutes later due to the alleged discovery of new evidence linking him to drug trafficking in the United States. Since then, the special jurisdiction for peace, members of the FARC party and supporters of the 2016 peace agreements have demanded his immediate release. The Supreme Court is also set to take over the investigation of his case. We are very happy with this decision. Jesus Santrich's rights are being reinstated after being violated by the government. This ruling is incredibly important because it recognizes his standing as a member of the lower house of Congress. We are just waiting to find out what procedures we need to follow so he can come here and swear into his post. And the bail hearing of Swedish software developer Ola Vini has started in Ecuador. Vini is facing spying charges due to his alleged links to Wikileaks founder Julian Assange. In the last minute development, the hearing was changed from an in-person court appearance to a video conference system. The switch came despite the fact Vini is currently in jail in the same city where the hearing is taking place. Social organizations and supporters of a free press have criticized this decision calling it another step backwards for Ecuador's justice system. And a number of climate resilience programs will be launched throughout the Caribbean at a cost of $49 million. The launch will take place as delegates from 20 Caribbean countries met in Barbados to come up with solutions to climate and disaster risks. One of the projects is a $31 million regional resilience facility to understanding risks in the Caribbean. The conference is organized by the World Bank and the European Union and Barbados government. CARICOM Ambassador Gail Matherin delivered remarks on behalf of CARICOM Secretary General. According to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, for example, for the period between 1990 and 2014, the Caribbean sustained losses of between 1.8 to 2% of gross domestic product per annum. And in many cases, losses have exceeded 100% of gross domestic project, product. For example, Ivan in Grenada in 2004, the Haitian earthquake in 2010, Irma and the effect, impact on the British Virgin Islands in 2017, Maria uh, and the impact in Dominica on 2017. Like this, we come to a first break here from the South. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Telesser English and on my account, of course, at Laura Pitelesser. Stay with us. We are back at trade unions in Argentina are holding a 24-hour general strike to protest against the economic and social policies of President Mauricio Macri. The strike has call, was called by the General Workers' Union and immediately supported by other main trade union federations, as well as by other social movements and the left-wing parties. The position has built a strong bloc to demand solutions to the current economic crisis, which hits the working class and the poor the hardest. Several people were injured when the police used pepper spray and rubber bullets to disperse protesters. A group of more than 4,000 demonstrators had gathered at the Puey Redon Bridge to block one of the access roads into Buenos Aires. They remained there until 11 in the morning and then marched to the Obelix Monument in the center of the capital. To have more details of this protest, we have the following reports from our correspondent Edgardo Esteban, and he was earlier with us. Welcome, Esteban. This general strike called by the Trade Union Federation is having a major impact here. There are no buses running, no flights. Schools, hospitals, and banks are closed, and this shows the level of discontent among workers with the government's economic policies. The day began with the roads leading into the capital being blocked. There were marches in the center of the city called by the left parties and social movements to demand a solution to the hardships people are facing. Added to this, there were 3,000 soup kitchens set up around the country, 
handing out a meal to the most vulnerable sectors of the population. The trade union federations have made clear they will continue to take actions like this until the government comes up with a response to this very critical economic situation that the people of Argentina are facing. Thank you, Edgardo. Teachers in Honduras are continuing their general strike against the government's bid to privatize education and health care. Educators are also calling for the removal of articles in the law and reforms that would expedite budget cuts for their, these sectors. Some of the reforms, which have been recommended by the International Monetary Fund, would also lead to mass layoffs. Doctors and nurses have also been stacking demonstrations and partial strikes since May 20th. And Mexican authorities have rescued 281 Central American asylum seekers in the state of Chiapas and arrested at least 10 human traffickers. The operation was carried out by police in the city of Comitán de Dominguez. Officers confiscated four cars and five trucks that were used to transport asylum seekers to the U.S. The Institute of, Mim of Migration transferred them to its local offices where they met consular officials. Authorities say 161 of those migrants came from what Mala and the rest from Honduras and El Salvador. And Pope Francis has sent a letter to Brazil's former president Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva asking him to continue his struggle for justice from inside the prison. In the text, Pope Francis said he knew Lula had endured great difficulties recently, especially with the loss of love ones like his wife, Marisa Leticia, his brother and his grandson Arthur, who was only seven years old. The Pope says he wants to show his spiritual closeness and wish Lula courage. He, so he won't lose hope and will continue to trust in God. Pope Francis ends his letter saying, Good will triumph over evil and the truth will overcome lies. And now we go to Paraguay, to Paraguay where health workers are also protesting to demand better conditions. Nurses marched in Asuncion to put pressure on the government to improve their pay and implement the nursing law, which regulates the profession. They are also opposing the economic policies of President Mario Abdo Benitez, which they say have eroded living standards or threatened their pension rights. We have come from the local health council in San Pedro. The situation is very bad there because the pay is so low. That's why we are asking for a proper contract with the Ministry of Health so that we can do much more to help our community and our patients. Earlier we received the following report from our correspondent Osvaldo Sayas, who was at the protest. Welcome. We're here at the march called by the Nurses Association of Paraguay. They're protesting here in front of the Ministry of Health and from here they're marching to the Ministry of Finance to demand that the law on nursing be respected. We talked to the leaders and they explained to us that many nurses are unemployed while others are underemployed at the so-called local health councils where they earn just half the minimum wage. They say this is a total contradiction because at the same time there is a lack of nurses in many public hospitals and many of the nurses there are overloaded with the number of patients they have to look after. They say the nursing law was adopted 12 years ago but the government still hasn't applied it fully. That's why they want to meet with the authorities and they plan to continue their protests. Thank, thank you, Osvaldo. Like this, we come to a second short break here in From the South. Make sure you also visit our website, clusterenglish.net. Welcome back. Chinese technology giant the Huawei has filed new legal actions against United States ban on purchases of its equipment by government agencies. Huawei's chief legal officer Song Lipin said Huawei was heading to court to halt what he called illegal actions against the company by the U.S. government. Song further accused President Trump administration of using unproven allegations to put the Chinese giant out of business. Just now, we filed a motion for a summary judgment. By doing this, we hope that the court can issue a judgment in the fastest and most efficient way. 
declared restrictions on Huawei as unconstitutional and stop enforcement of related sections. And the Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari has been sworn in for a second term following the, his re-election in February. He was inaugurated on Wednesday in the capital Abuja in front of thousands of his supporters. Buhari will have to deal with an economic slowdown and rising ethnic violence in Nigeria during his new term at the helm of Africa's largest economy. We are here to witness the inauguration of Mr. President for the second tenure. Of course, uh, yeah, yeah, you are aware that we are now talking of next level, which means we've uh, uh, finished the first level of the administration. We are now moving into the era of consolidation. So our expectation is that Mr. President will now focus more on the issue of security, employment, and agriculture. As Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari starts his second term in office, militant groups in the terrorist organization Boko Haram remain one of the greatest challenges for the country is facing. Earlier, we spoke with an early political analyst Socrates Mambalu, and let's hear what he had to say about this. And many Nigerians actually voted for him based on the fact that he was a former military general, and they expected that he would uh, take the cause and the fight seriously. But for the past four years, there has been no difference, really, as compared to the past president, uh, uh, President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, and things seem to actually have been, seems, things seem to actually have deteriorated. Uh, there has been no change in service chiefs, no change in army command structure. The same chief of army staff is still the same person. The same chief of defense staff is still the same person. There has been nothing concrete that Nigerians have seen that Buhari has done about uh, the Boko Haram issue. Uh, there have also been issues of soldiers not being paid enough, among other things. So there's really a lot and a lot that Buhari must do to change that situation. And Ghana has become the second African country to roll out the world's first proven anti-malaria vaccine after Malawi. The country's health authorities said this will help reduce the risk of children contracting this disease, known by its lab initials RTSS is the first vaccine that has demonstrated it can significantly reduce malaria in children. Over 5 million confirmed cases of malaria were recorded last year in Ghana. So economically, when you get malaria, the family's income loses some income because the time that you spend to look after the child, you have used the time for other things. So it will go a long way. This vaccine is able to reduce malaria in children and the five. I'm sure it will help. And as you were just seeing, this is the second part of our series Mozambique, the people rebuild. Our correspondent Andre Vieira show us the challenges faced by the Mozambican youth after the passing of Ciclonidae. Young people are fundamental in any process of change. In Mozambique, it was the youth who formed a large part of the People's Army, which won the country's independence from Portugal in 1975. Over 40 years later, they are still an integral part of the country's reconstruction after Cyclone Idai hit. And they know that the future of this nation is in their hands. The country needs us to continue pushing forward. We, the youth, need to study to help our nation. Part of this new generation's struggle is the fight for gender equality in a male-dominated society. Women are the same as men. We have equal rights. The idea that there are things that men do and things that women do no longer exists. For me, men and women can do the same things. A woman can be even president. That's what equal rights mean. One of the greatest challenges is creating new opportunities. According to data from Mozambique Ministry of Labor, in 2017, unemployment affected 21.1% of the population, especially young people. Even the World Bank shows that in 2018, the unemployment rate stood at 24.9%, and those figures rise to 42.38% for people between 15 and 24 years old. 
The main challenge in Mozambique as a young man is the lack of opportunities. Young people in Mozambique try to be innovative, but I think that there is not a lot of support for us. Life is not easy in a country recovering from a terrible natural disaster. Yorancia Jao from Casanova in Sofala decided to be a teacher from a very young age. Ever since I started school, I wanted to work with children. I wanted to teach, just like I was taught by my teachers. This is how my dream began. She's betting on education to bring forth social change in the country. We can say that the importance of education lies in the very development of our country. According to the Mozambican government, in 2017, 94% of the country's kids were enrolled in primary school. But the numbers dropped drastically when it comes to secondary education, reaching only 13%. This is a challenge for all generations that deem education as the solution for all Mozambicans. And with these stories of hope and rebuild, we come to the end of this brief. But you can always continue with Telesur connecting the global thousands. Until next time, thank you for watching.